Right. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. I'm, I'm not sure this is within my remit, but it's never stopped me before. But given the temperature, if you want to take off your jackets or loosen your tie, I'm sure <laughs> no one on the stage is going to mind. So please uh, make, yourself, uh, make yourself comfortable. Um, my name is uh, Nick Fry. I'm the uh, chief executive of the uh, Mercedes GP AMG Patronus Formula One team. You might ask why have they got a chap from uh, Mercedes-Benz uh, speaking at this forum. And uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Michael Schumacher's Mercedes and the engine is not made in Stuttgart, but both are made in Northamptonshire. <laughs> so that's a, uh, a, a, good, a good start, I hope. And uh, hopefully there's a message there which uh, the rest of the speakers this afternoon um, will we'll get through. Um, the, the, the theme is developing a global sustainable automotive industry for the future, which is clearly a big challenge. But I know from the um, sort of gold medal list of uh, speakers we've got this afternoon that uh, I'm sure the, the message will get across that there is a huge amount going on. We've actually got some, we were oversubscribed uh, on the stage, so we're going to have to rattle through at a fair rate of knots, so I reserve the rights to uh, move people on quickly because everything is fairly uh, uh, quick fire through till no later than quarter to five will be uh, with a break in the middle. So uh, if you can help us do that, uh, that would be absolutely great. Um, to start proceedings, it's uh, a huge honor uh, for me to uh, introduce the Secretary of State for Biz um, and also the Joint Head of the Automotive Council. Dr. Vince Cable. Well, thank you, and, and can I welcome you all uh, very warmly here, and also thank the, the sponsors. We've had several, very valued, uh, Airbus, Atkins, uh, Jaguar Land Rover, uh, and Rolls-Royce. And I hope that our overseas visitors, and I think there are quite a few of you here from overseas, uh, have had an opportunity to understand not just some of the kind of partnerships and investment opportunities, but to get the flavor of the quality of British engineering and innovation. And I think that's a good point to start on, because as sort of Nick implied in his introduction, um, Britain has been somewhat self-deprecating about its uh, engineering and innovation excellence over the years. And indeed, there is this sort of popular view in some quarters that we don't make things anymore, but actually there are some extremely high quality companies here, not least uh, the one that you've spoken for. Uh, and the, the, the history of um, the sort of the pessimism about this industry, I think it originated probably three, four decades ago when the motor industry went through a very bad patch. And you may remember the strikes and the bad management of the industry declined, but it's been reborn uh, and is now one of our most successful manufacturing industries. And of course, a lot of industries associated with it. And of course, the success is down to the companies and the technology they employ and the people they employ. But I think part of the success, and I don't want to claim too much for it, but I think it is a, quite an important ingredient, is the fact that there is a very good partnership arrangement with government, what we call the Automotive Council. And I'll say a little bit more about the cooperative approach that we've adopted in relation to the industry. And the way I see it is it fits within a bigger structure, something I call uh, industry strategy, where we try to take a long-term view about what's important for the UK, which transcends particular governments and particular parliaments, um, because we're dealing with industries where investments are made over a long period of time. And, you can, and a key element of the industrial strategy is recognizing that manufacturing is very important. The crude statistics are very deceptive. I think it's about 10% of GDP. It's about the same as France, the United States. Doesn't sound very much, but actually is this sector, the manufacturing sector, is disproportionately important because it accounts for half of British exports. It accounts for much of the R&D in the economy and much of the productivity growth that actually drives living standards. So it's absolutely essential that we succeed in that area. It's also a recognition that although the industry is and has to be driven by private enterprise and commercial decisions, there are areas where markets fail or 
are insufficient, uh, where government does have a supporting role. A good, good example would be training, apprenticeships, which we do increasing amounts of. Another is in innovation, research and development, and the support particularly for the more blue skies aspect of that, and also the development of supply chains, and I'll come to that in a few moments. But the, the position we now have is 40 companies manufacturing vehicles here, uh, mainstream manufacturers, but also the specialists, the Formula One, uh, the motorsport industry, uh, 1.4 million cars, 2.5 million engines, and over 80% of it's exported. And within the last 12 months, uh, Britain actually now runs a surplus on motor vehicles for the first time in uh, almost 40 years. Uh, and in, in current very difficult conditions, and I don't think any of us, certainly in government, underestimate how difficult the economic conditions are at the moment, this is an industry which has uh, not just uh, expanding production, uh, but is a great advertisement for British industry. Um, a very flexible labor force, for example. I recently went to the United States as part of the discussions we had with one of our leading investors, General Motors, about investing here in Ellesmere Port rather than in Germany. They have a choice, a difficult situation. And one of the points they made, and which is often made by other manufacturers, is that it, it was the flexibility of the British workforce and the willingness to adapt, which was one of their key factors in attracting them here. So there's a variety of issues there, and on the back of all of that, the recent success and the expansion and the flexibility of the industry, um, we've had over the last 18 months, two years, a kind of massive vote of confidence in the industry by the investors we calculate that something of the order of five and a half billion pounds has now been committed in investment, much of it now going in by our leading car producers. Uh, BMW just recently announced uh, 250 million in the three UK sites on top of the 500 million it did last year. Uh, Jaguar Land Rover has got an extraordinarily ambitious investment program. A new engine plant, as you know, and a major expansion of their R&D facilities and the two billion that they've committed in investments has already generated 2,000 new jobs in the U, 8,000, not 2,000 in the UK. Uh, Nissan uh, recently confirmed uh, their decision to produce two new models here at Sunderland, uh, representing over 250 million of investments and there's 3,000 new jobs associated with that. And our other leading producers like Toyota, Bentley, have also had major investment commitments too. Uh, but we, we, we shouldn't be complacent because economic conditions are difficult and there is at the moment a big divergence between what's happening in the UK where I think car registrations in July were now 9% up and what's happening across the channel in the European market where car demands uh, shrunk by that 7%. And there are strong pressures uh, within uh, the European Union to try to approach problems of overcapacity in the European industry in a collective approach. Now that would create serious problems, I think, for companies and indeed countries like ours, which are already f producing at full capacity because they're commercially doing extremely well. And I think we will be absolutely insisting that decisions are made on a commercial basis and not politically, and we will fight very strongly against any pressures to make us do that. Uh, and it's, uh, we will have considerable, I think, strength in making those decisions. The fact that we have the Automotive Council, um, which Richard chairs with me, which uh, many of you may not be familiar with, but it, it's, I think the best way of describing it is that it's designed to provide a sustained high-level conversation uh, between government and industry and across industry. Um, and one of the key priorities which the Automotive Council has had over the last year or so is trying to identify the gaps in the supply chain in the UK and filling them in a systematic way. Uh, they've identified, I think, something of the order of three billion of supply chain business opportunities. 
the economic conditions are actually now making it more attractive to do that work in the UK. A lot of it went abroad in previous years, but now a combination of um, avoiding disruption in long distance supply, um, exchange rate factors and others are making it much more attractive to invest here. But there is a big commitment involved and big decisions. I think you all have in your packs um, a summary of that, that work. Uh, and if you are a, wanting to be a UK supplier or are a UK supplier and uh, wish to take that further, um, uh, my people, people from the UK TI, would be very, very happy to talk to you about how we can help with contacts in order to take that further. And we have some very specific um, initiatives which we also think will help. We have something called the Manufacturing Advisory Service, particularly for SME companies. And one of the things we launched recently was a 125 million supply chain fund. This is the, in order to co-finance investments in supply chains. The first 32 bids we're evaluating at the moment, that's about aggregating to about 90 million. And the round two uh, closes at noon on the 12th of September. So there's a lot of interest in, in, in working with us on developing supply chains in that way. Uh, the other area where I think we can help, and I say I don't want to overclaim for what government can do, this is obviously a commercial set of decisions that the industry has to make, but I think we can help in some ways. And the other respect is in respect of technology. Um, we've put in uh, a commitment of something in the order of 400 million in the ultra low carbon vehicles and purchases of alternatively fuel cars last month were something in the order of 45% up on what they were a year ago. This is a small industry but it's now developing very rapidly and partly on the basis of the technology that we're promoting. Uh, we have, in addition, in a very, very difficult uh, climate for government spending, and my department, just to put this in context, I've had to manage cuts of something of the order of 25% in my department. We have nonetheless set aside more resources for apprenticeships, and we've protected the science budget, uh, four and a half billion, uh, and indeed we've increased um, a rather meagre budget for capital investment in science by just under 500 million. And one particularly useful initiative, and I think one of the things I'm proudest of having been associated with, is launching a whole series of catapults, as we call them, innovation centers, which are concentrated um, groups of researchers at the applied end of research, but high-level innovative work, uh, basic uh, science, but linked to industrial applications. And the model, if there is one, is the German Fraunhofer system, uh, but in the UK case, unlike the Fraunhofer's, which cover a variety of technology, most of these are specialized. And the first one was in advanced manufacturing, centers in Sheffield, but there are outposts in uh, the Midlands, in the Northeast, in Glasgow, and in Bristol, it's a hub and spoke model. In addition to that, the uh, Technology Strategy Board, uh, and I see Ian Gray in the audience who heads that up, um, has a, an ambitious program which adds up to something of the order of 300 million for the automobile sector. And we announced last month uh, 270 million of UK government funding alongside 29 million for the, from the automotive industry in the latest stage in that automobile linked um, research funding. So I think when we put all this together, uh, we have a success story. Uh, we have a, 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 an industry which government is getting behind. We see this as an absolutely key sector in our objective of developing exports, of promoting business investment, uh, and it's, it's world class in quality. And I'm delighted to be able to play a role alongside Richard in promoting it. And uh, on that basis, I'd now like to get him to give the industry standpoint. Thank you very much indeed.